from Jeremiah of being in Potter's house is, I think, a very good reminder to us of where we stand in relationship to God. Because it's only natural, as we have been going through our lives, to feel as if we truly are in control of all aspects of it. And it's true enough that we are in control of a lot of those aspects of how we, you know, where we live and how we dress and how we spend our money and, you know, what kind of food we eat and the kind of work we do, etc. And so, in that sense, there is this level of control. But then we have things that remind us that we are not always in control. For example, when it was raining today, uh, so much for the control for having, you know, the liturgy and the picnic outside. Uh, you know, I said, well, I guess I fell down on the job you know, for that. But sickness, loss of, loss of job, tensions in the world, fluctuations in the stock market, all kinds of things that touch our lives one way or another, we find after a while that they really are not under our control. And it's a good reminder because ultimately we have to decide Who's going to be in charge of our life? Who really is the one? And of course, that's the Lord, that's God. Now when Jeremiah was, was uh, speaking uh, to the people, telling them you know, what God was saying, it was at another one of those moments when God was none too pleased with his people and reminding them that, you know, I can be like the potter. I can, you know, decide that I want to remake what's ever there. You know, I can be fashioning something that's supposed to be beautiful, but then either I can't get the clay to really work well in my hands, or the clay sometimes has a mind of its own, and so then we get something flawed and we've got to start all over again. And so this is what God has done down through the centuries with his people because he's had to refashion us any number of times because ultimately we're in God's hands but we still want to assert our autonomy and that's sort of like the clay when it doesn't want to really cooperate with the hands of the potter. And so the potter has to kind of start over again. And that's really a good thing for us. Because it means that God never gives up on his creation, never gives up on us as individuals. He can continue to work with us and fashion us and shape us and call us to be more than we are and to be more open to receive what it is that he wants to give us and how he wants us to live in this world who and how he wants us to love and serve and care and give and not just think that we are always in control and we can keep things uh, the way we always want them to be doesn't mean that God is going to, you know, crush us and, and do terrible things to us. <clears throat> but yet we all experience setbacks. We all experience disappointments. We all experience those moments that tell us, no, you aren't in charge, ultimately, of your life. Remember who is in charge and trust in Him. Trust in God's love. Trust in God's mercy. Trust in God's lead in all the things that you have to do in your life. Then, it's similar with, with uh, in the second lesson today, uh, the only time, I think, in the three-year cycle,
that we read from the letter to Philemon from St. Paul is just those, you know, 20 some verses. And uh, it's one of the only real, let's say, personal letters of Paul that, uh, can, that survives. And we see that he's writing to um, Philemon, a friend of his, about Onesimus, the slave. Onesimus <laughs> escaped and ended up catching up with Paul. The tradition says he got all the way to Rome. Others say, well, maybe he got as far as when Paul was in prison in Ephesus before going to Rome. Wherever, he was an escaped slave. But Paul calls Philemon to let go of his previous way of thinking in order to receive Onesimus back, but not as a slave, but now as what he has become, a brother in Christ, because he has, he has by water and the Holy Spirit, become a new creation, just like Philemon. And then, of course, we may not have seen it, but Paul does kind of, you know, tweak Philemon's nose and say, well, after all, you know, you only owe me your life, so you can at least do this for me, you know, receive him back as you, you know, as a beloved brother. But that was a, a real reshaping that Philemon was called to through Paul by God himself to change his way of looking at this man. It, it, true, he broke the law, he escaped, but receiving him back the discretion was all on Philemon's part. Do I accept him? Do I treat him as an equal now? Or do I forget what Paul said and just treat him and hand him over because he ran away? <coughs> and again, you know, even in the gospel today, Jesus makes some pretty uh, strong statements, none of which would be possible without the grace that he promises us. Possessions aren't always material things. Possessions can sometimes be attitudes, ideas, beliefs. Sometimes we cling to those because they give us direction, definition, whatever they might be. But then as we grow in our faith, maybe sometimes we're challenged in some of those, those beliefs, those ideas, those assumptions. Maybe we have certain ideas about other races. And as we grow in our faith, then we have to let go of some of those things. Otherwise, we can't be faithful. Otherwise, the potter can't really shape us the way we need to to receive everything that he wants to give us. And it can be also about, you know, different things in the world, in the church, whatever it might be. Things that we have clung to with great tenacity about how we do things, how we think about, about others who may share this faith, as the Christian faith, but not necessarily our way, and how we treat them or how we speak about them more than treat them. There are all kinds of things that we cling to, that we are called to by the Lord in our growth in faith to re-examine, let go of. It might mean that for a while we're just trying to figure out where we stand and what we really think about this, that, or the other thing that's going on in the world, in our country, in our own family. But if this is something that the Lord is calling us to, then what's happening is an opportunity to really grow and come out on the other side of this, not confused, but even more strengthened and better capable of loving and serving and understanding and demonstrating compassion and forgiveness than we were before. Because ultimately, God is in the business of 
restoration and renewal in order to give us a fuller life. He's not in the position, uh, usually in the job of, of trying to, you know, destroy what he has made, but rather to reshape it and refashion it so it can become even more beautiful, something beautiful for God. So today, maybe when we're alone, sometime later today, we can think about that image of the potter, think about how we may need to be reshaped, reformed, the things that stand in the way of us really being fully alive in God, being more at peace with God in the, in the world that we live in, and ask Him to give us the grace to reshape and reform us so that we can become even more than we are now, the kinds of instruments that God needs us to be so that that love and mercy and compassion of Jesus Christ our Lord can be more real to the people in the world around us, especially the ones we live with and the ones that we deal with every day. Jesus comes to us once again today not in judgment, but in mercy. He comes to us again today through his word in one another who believe and in the great sacrament of the altar so that we can be reminded again of who we are and whose we are and what it is that we are being called to become, those living icons, images of Jesus himself. Thank <laughs> you.